I'm Zach Gershberg, uh, a professor of journalism here at Idaho State University. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming to Boise to attend the IACS conference. Uh, I'm not a scholar of sport per se, but the presentations thus far uh, have been cr critically illuminating and I've enjoyed volunteering. It's kind of refreshing to be at a conference and not present. Um, it's helped me reflect in some ways on my own aborted career as a sports writer. The less said, the better. Um, my only modest contribution to the conference, I suppose, is encouraging Karen, the program planner, and Jim DeSanza, our department chair at ISU, uh, to consider bringing Shireen Ahmed uh, for a keynote address. Uh, they committed to making that happen and deserve all the credit, for it's only natural that Shireen, um, uh, g given her poignant, passionate uh, voice about sport, race, and gender, that she deliver a keynote. But I must admit, selfishly, uh, to having my own reasons for wanting her to come. And that's as a multi-platform journalism professor um, who has shared her work with students as collectively a sterling example of how to negotiate the chaotic, polarized, and freelance landscape of news and sport in a globalized economy and media and infrastructure. When I met Shireen for the first time yesterday, she worried whether her uh, lack of exposure to academic debates over media ethics qualified her as a journalist. She has nothing to worry about uh, in my mind. In the 21st century, uh, the line between advocacy, journalism, and media have been blurred, and Shireen is emblematic of how to practice this, uh, these media practices informatively, ethically, and insightfully. Uh, but intersections in the field of journalism and political advocacy are not new, and Shireen's work calls to mind the 20th century journalist Marvel Cook, who was uh, the first African-American woman to report full-time for a white-owned newspaper while also engaging in lifelong political advocacy. Shireen hails from Nova Scotia and studied at the University of Toronto, where she played soccer and road crew. She's made a tremendous impact through her reporting on issues of misogyny and Muslim women in sport, uh, chronicling <clears throat> the end to the hijab bans in international organizations like FIFA and FIBA. She possesses a clear, strong writing style that provokes thought by challenging assumptions and hegemonic practices, and an intimacy that effectively shares her experiences as an athlete herself. Um, her work has appeared in, among other publications, Great Britain's The Guardian, Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated, Vice, and The Huffington Post. And she even proved the listicle can be a fresh reporting tool. In writing for BuzzFeed, here's how 15 hardcore athletes train during Ramadan. Shireen is also a terrific Twitter follow, and clicking on her feed reveals an ongoing course in sport, media, and culture unto itself. Uh, additionally, Shireen is one of the founding members and broadcasters for the aptly named podcast, Burn It All Down, which I highly recommend. The logics of patriarchy, late capitalism, and Islamophobia, and racism more generally are deservingly in interrogated, and it critically stands out in a field of podcasting that continues to grow. I just hope you all have secured the movie rights, television rights, publishing rights. In all, it is a real treat for me but more so, it is an honor, an honor, I think, for all of us to have her here with us today, uh, to have such a consummate journalist, tireless advocate, and passionate voice with us here in Boise. So thank you. Please join me then in welcoming Shireen Ahmed to IACS in Boise. Thank you so much, Zach. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I begin, I would actually like to recognize the land that we're on as the original land of Native peoples of the Great Basin Shoshone and Bannock tribes, of the Shoshone Bannock, the Shoshone Piute, and the Plateau tribe of the Coeur d'Alene, Nepers, and Kootenai. Um, a very special thank you to Karen Hartman, Michelle Lee, and Jim DeSanza and their team for organizing the conference, and of course, everybody at ICS for having me. It's an honor to be here, something that I've been looking forward to for a very long time. Um, I'm honored to be in Boise with you all, and especially after sampling some of the potatoes because they were amazing. Um, I'm a freelance sports writer, a podcast co-host, and a sports activist. And what is a sports activist? It's a term for an athlete or someone in sports who uses their platform for social change 
to draw attention to a campaign or to advocate for those in marginalized communities. And the intersections and the crossovers from marginalized communities, from everything from LGBTIQ to racialized communities, they literally intersect and connect at all these points. And very often our struggles are very connected. And I use sports because I believe that sports are a vehicle of connection, of political expression, and of understanding. My parents came to Canada and developed strong times to their communities through sport. My father rode crew, um, whereas in Karachi, Pakistan, he was denied joining crew because of his race at the All English Karachi Boat Club. So when he came to Canada in 1963, he was warmly welcomed at McGill. Um, my mother was a young physician when she moved to Canada and find joy in community and the Montreal Canadiens. Well, the part about joy can be debated, but it continues to this day. And I have seen sport used as a tool of development and treatment from trauma from everyone from young girls, refugee girls, um, Syrian refugee girls placed, displaced from their homes and now living in Zaghdadi camp in Jordan. We have seen how young boys and players use basketball to connect with others and start important conversations about toxic masculinity and exploitation of black and brown bodies in amateur sport. We've seen Palestinian women use drag racings as a means to resist occupation in Gaza and the West Bank. And feminist organizations in Iran that dedicate their attentions to the fact that Iranian women are not permitted to enter stadiums even if they want to support their favorite teams. So these are some of the things I will touch on today. Sports is a way to rejoice and to find drama, but also ensure that we do not permit uncritical celebrations. As academics, activists, and advocates for sports, and as guardians of the games, if we don't understand and unlearn systemic behaviors that plague sports, the purest form of enjoyment, and yes, connection, it continues to be marred. And I'm gonna speak with you about a variety of issues that are specific to Muslim women in sports but not restricted to our communities. In his remarks yesterday, my friend and mentor Dave Zirin said that sports are something that women were denied. And in the case of Muslim identifying women who must navigate through systems against class, race, gender, and sexual identity, there is still much being denied. So let's all hope this works. So who are Muslim athletes? What do they look like? Who writes about them? Who cares? So these are some, you're supposed to laugh there, Molly. Can you? Okay. <laughs> I need to keep this interesting or I'm going to lose her to the NCAA women's tournament. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about that because in addition to just my writing and research, I think the idea of what Muslim women look like in sports, that's based on old tropes and I think it's important to unpack a little bit of those. So Muslim women who identify culturally, spiritually, or historically with Islam and compete in sports, they come from over 62 countries around the world. They look, they speak different languages, they have different ways of practice if they choose to practice. Sometimes athletes choose to identify as Muslim when it's only by name that they're, or heritage, that they're actually connected to the faith. But it doesn't mean that it takes away from their right to do so. So these are some, um, well, that's loud. These are some, of, I think that when we think about Muslim women, we automatically think of, well, if I did this presentation in 2015, I would say something different. But maybe now everyone thinks of Ibtihaj Muhammad, who was the first black Muslim woman to compete for the United States at the 2016 Rio Olympics with a hijab on. But there's other people that are Muslim, and they are athletes, and they identify as such. So I'd like to kind of talk about them. One of my favorites is Nadia Nadim. Nadia Nadim is an incredible footballer, and when she's not playing professional football for um, Lyon, she is actually, sorry, Paris Saint-Germain, and my apologies, she is actually a medical student because she's not good enough to be superwoman on the field. Um, she was a refugee from Afghanistan and learned how to play football and soccer in Denmark in a refugee camp, and she's pretty damn good. Um, Asiya Muhammad is a tennis player, and she is actually practicing in Virginia, and she's training to be one of the most amazing on the circuit. We've got Layla Ali, who I think everybody knows. Dave did a wonderful bit of a talk about her father 
yesterday. She's not competing in boxing anymore, but she was, and I think it's really important. Um, Fatima Ali is a very, very dedicated Washington Capitals fan, and she's captain of the United Arab Emirates women's hockey team. And you're all like, what? They have a hockey team in the Emirates? Yes, they do. Of course they do. Um, so she was actually brought over by the Washington Capitals and her undeniable adoration for Alexa, Alexa Vechkin was incredible. Like there was a selfie that she took, she did the puck drop with like a toothless Ovechkin and her totally natural, she, he, the Capitals organization went so far as to invite their team over and help train them. So that's really, really interesting. And we can talk about their White House visit at another time. Um, I wanted to also point out this one that was really important for me. This is a young warm woman named um, Layla Ashraf who is in Pakistan and she's in what's called a Urdu medium school, which means she doesn't go to a fancy private school. She actually goes to a government uh, school and she's one of the top 10 runners in the entire country for her age and she doesn't wear shoes when she runs. And this was not necessarily a socio-political statement. She was just more comfortable. And somebody asked her, my friend Natasha Rahil, who writes for the Tribune in Pakistan, who's a sports journalist. And she said, I just learned to run this way. And I'm more comfortable doing it. And I just, she's just badass. Um, I'm going to play this. No, I'm not going to play this. Or maybe I'm going to play that. So this is a little video that I want to watch. Can you, Karen, can you press play? But I do want you to keep in mind what's not in this video, if that's possible. Is there sound? Thank you to the tech crew. cannot be lost on me that this is Nike. <laughs> so I think that's important. At the same time, I also, um, I also sort of struggle with the fact that it's this massive corporatization of identity of women that aren't often seen or heard in the sports world. But then there's a part of me that's like, oh my God, I wanna buy that, whatever they're selling. And I say this very honestly, Adidas, and I'm a brand loyalist for Adidas because football, whatnot, I'm waiting for their sports hijab to come out, and it will any day now. So I have to be fair, because you all can call me out on Twitter and be like, yeah, okay, I thought you said that this was bad. Yes, it's bad, but we can also pick out parts because we just can. Um, we're allowed. Yes, I said so. That's my fatwa on that. Um, so there's one thing I did want to mention in this in this piece, in this video, and it's very heartening because it, it even shows traditional horse racing and someone in Arabian regalia. But at the same time, you didn't see a single Afro-Arab in that entire video. So, I mean, to the marketers at Nike who are definitely marketing to the majority of that region, to assume and to actually talk or present this in a way that doesn't represent any black Arab women is offensive and it's untrue. 
So that's something that I wanted to point out because in addition to recognizing what we see as steps within there, you're excluding a massive population of people. And that was not, you know, that, that's definitely something that was seen and recognized. I wrote about it for a Muslim feminist blog site that I contribute to called Muslim on Media Watch. And just the unapologetic way and the exclusion, even within our own communities, is something that is definitely recognized in the work that I do as well. So this is my friend, um, JJ Roble, Roble. Her name's Jawai here, but she goes by JJ. Um, she's fabulous. She's actually a level one certified FIFA referee with the FA in England. She came to the UK as a refugee with her family and she started to referee. Now, the video of her refereeing, like division three or four men in England on these muddy pitches is fantastic because she's basically like, I'm not gonna take anything from you, and she gives them a yellow, and they're like, what just happened? And she's 5'2", and she's mighty, but she's creating a space, and even unintentionally, I spoke to her when I was in England last year, and she says, it was not my intention to be a mentor or anyone for anyone to look up to. I just wanted to participate in sport. And that's very often some of the ways that Muslim women, when they've shared their stories with me and have been very honored by that, it's an unintentional way that they become role models. She just wanted to participate in sport and she was very good at it. But along the way, she gets messages and now she speaks like in different places in, in, in the UK. And she didn't realize the impact she would have on other people. Um, so when we're talking about blackness and Muslim women's identity, I think that the whole idea about Muslim women just simply being Arab and fair-skinned, because there's an incredible amount of shadism within the community, it's really important to recognize Dalia Muhammad, who is a gold medalist in the 400-meter hurdles for the United States. And what I love about her and her friendship with Ibtihaj Muhammad, who, as I mentioned, is the first American to compete and represent the United States with a hijab on at the Olympics. They have the same last name, they're not related, it's the most common name in the world, not all Ahmeds or Muhammads are related, but they're, they're like sisters. And they're two black, strong Muslim women, but one, they look very different in their uniforms. And I think that speaks so much, and I'm really happy that that happens, is because what it does is it cuts down and breaks down the idea that Muslim women are a monolith and only look one way, because we, we don't. <laughs> Um, this is Shirin Jarami, and I really like Shirin. Um, she has the same name as me, but that's not the reason why I like her. She also does Iron Man um, races, and that whole thing just boggles my mind because I want to get the shirt that Alex Ovechkin says that running sucks, even though I'm a soccer player, but you're supposed to laugh again, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm like so serious about that. So what she does is she actually worked with a uniform company to help and lobby the Iron Man Association to allow hijab because they have uniform restrictions. So that was a bit of a, that was a bit fun. Like she was so happy to be able to take the Iranian flag and run with it. And it was a flag that she said in a piece that a lot of people didn't even know. They're like, where's that flag from? Is it from Latin America? She's like, no, Iran. And they're like, what? So that was pretty great. And like I said, just by her existence, she's breaking down those ideas and stereotypes, which is not a job that Muslim women always sign up for, but one that we're voluntold. So this is Khadija Diggs. I love her. She lives in Atlanta, Georgia. I want to be her. She'll kill me if I tell you this, but she's 57 and she's running triathlons. Yeah, she, don't tell her that I told you how old she is. She's amazing, and she started running triathlons when she turned 50 as a gift to herself. She's amazing. This is also a woman that, there's not a lot of people that look like her on that circuit. And like she just continues to like push and push and push. She was a track athlete when she was younger, but she says as she grew older, she wanted more of a challenge. Like, I don't know. My idea of challenging myself at 50 doesn't involve triathlons, but that's okay. Um, we're gonna talk about media now. So I'm gonna complain about media a little bit because I'm allowed. Zach gave me permission to do so. Um, so I'm actually part of the Women's Media Center there. Um, they have a board of sort of, not a board, sorry, like a category, a, the address book sort of, what is it called? Thank you, the directory. And 
they also put out a media report every year, and the Women's Media Center is a fantastic resource for everybody. You don't have to pay for it. They also give links to toolkits and things like how to report on rape. I know the Chicago Task Force has one, and in Canada, Femifesto has one, which I don't know why people don't use, particularly sports editors. They have toolkits on how to report on race, and they give you links to lots of things. So, I mean, I really, really love them. So they did... So it's basically, this is very clear. So you're thinking, okay, this is five years ago, so we must be doing a lot better than this. So sports editors, in terms of, you've got men, for race, gender, they're an F. So people of color, and then women. And I just want to point out that for the sports editors one, and, in, and even of all staffs, and there's no actual statistic for women of color. So you're either a person of color or a woman, because it's unfathomable that you could be both and be an editor because it's just simply, there was not enough data to tally to make up like 0, 0.0 whatever percent. So unfortunately for women of color out there, you gotta choose your category. Um, also, this is the same report about their gender reporting in terms of sports editors and, and total staffs and who does what. And this is from 2002, the Associated Press Sports Editors racial and gender report card. And the AP stopped doing that for a year or two just because the results weren't changing. Okay, good call AP, stop reporting on it because you know the results are bad. Um, so this is again what we know. This is not a shock to anybody that men dominate the media. Like we actually know this. But what comes next, right? Like what comes next? And the reason I talk about media a lot in the presentations that I give is because who tells the story is as, as important as what the story is. So let's get up to here. No, I love this one. Sports is at the top. Print, what do women report on? 10%, 90% of what you read online or in print is done by white, able-bodied, cishet men. So one of the reasons that I this is relevant, and I will always love this tweet by my friend, and she's also a really great follow. Um, this headline came out in 2016. FIVB, which is the volleyball the federation that governs the sport, allowed women to be covered in beach volleyball. So when I started to report on this and covering, and with Ibtihaj Muhammad coming out, there was a lot of, a lot of attention to what women were wearing, and in particular, Muslim women were wearing. Um, so what ended up happening is I did a little bit of research and I came to this understanding that came Muslim women, it was very much about control of women's bodies, which I still, and I know and believe it is. But what I didn't realize was the FIVB has actually sanctioned what women wear on beach volleyball courts to the millimeter, centimeter rather, of their bikini bottoms. So it's not just what Muslim women can't wear, it's what all women are allowed to wear. And how many of you think that men have the same restrictions? Yeah, they don't. So basically, y'all can wear whatever you want, but women have to fit into a certain category. And that's truly the essence of what I talk about, is this is about misogyny and control of women's bodies. And the way that this photo was framed when Doha El Hobashi of Egypt, they're like, oh, she wore a burkini. I'm like, wait, this is not a burkini. It's a rash guard, and she's wearing swimming tights. So if we're going to report on this, can we please get it right? It really, it's, I've never seen a neon turquoise burqa in my life. I would be open to wearing one, but I don't. This is not one of those. And just even the way... It was, it, was, it was talked about, like a bikini or a burqa, or I even saw a tweet that says, look at the clash of civilizations between the, I'm like, they're playing beach volleyball. Like, I don't know a lot about like military history, but I just really didn't think two women playing beach volleyball fit into that category, but whatever. So my other gripe, and this is a big one, just before the Olympics, um, the Washington Post decided to do a series on Arab women and the history of the Olympics. I had a good time with this one, y'all. So Chuck Culpepper, the Washington Post, who has subsequently blocked me on Twitter, um, <laughs> did a piece, and the opening sort of lead was, Middle Eastern women were discouraged from sport. A new generation now chases Olympic glory. So my reply to him was, Chuck, 
Chuck, may I call you Chuck, um, you can Google because this is actually untrue. And what happens in is that journalists can be very lazy and they don't take the time to look at context or history. Now being part of Burn It All Down has been very helpful because I have two sport historians and very admin professors on with us who are like, no, context. Context is very important and you all are professors, you know this, or aspiring professors. So this is very important. So a little bit of history that Chuck could have figured out very easily. The first one, African woman, Arab woman and Muslim woman to win a gold medal was Noel El Mutakawal. She won gold in the 400 meter hurdles in LA in 84. So yeah, I understand that's only one woman, but there's not only one woman, there's actually more women who have done amazing things. And I think in the way that we move forward and talk about things from a critical lens, erasing these kinds of histories is problematic because it keeps repeating a tone and setting the tone of a narrative that's untrue. What Nawal did, and this is a fantastic piece of history, and I really love her so much. The day that she raced, the, she won, the entire city of Casablanca was out on the streets partying. And the king of Morocco declared a rule of law that every girl born on that day would be named Nawal. So if you meet a whole bunch of Moroccan women named Nawal, they're probably born on the day that she won her gold medal. So, I mean, these are interesting pieces that people like don't know and sometimes just feel are like irrelevant, but what she did was she set the tone for the way that Moroccan women can participate in track and field. And I just love that. Then you've got the first women's soccer team in Aleppo, Syria, circa like 1954. Like that's a long time ago. So to use the argument that, you know, Muslim and Arab women had never been allowed to play in sports is actually factually untrue as well. Um, right now, there's basketball players that are coming up from the surge of resist uh, the resisting in Somalia against places in particular regions that Al-Shabaab has control of. So what the women do is they say they're getting together to have a party, they shut off the place to all men, and they play basketball inside and protect from any other men coming in. So it's pretty incredible that women who are often on the front lines of grassroots movements and resistance anyway, particularly black women, find ways to use sport to to break free from those crippling effects of misogyny. One of my favorite stories, and I wrote about this for the Shadow League last year in Women's History Month, is a Turkish fencer named Halet Kembat. And to my knowledge, she is the first Muslim woman on record to have participated in the Olympics. She was in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, participating in foil fencing. And she actually was in the stadium when Jesse Owens won. And there was Adolf Hitler as well. So afterwards, Adolf Hitler, after he finished having his like meltdown, because a black man had just declared himself to be the fastest and best in the world, he wanted to meet Halet Kembet. And she rejected his meeting. And she says, I do not want to meet with you because I don't agree with your political opinions. So she was promptly asked to leave Germany. And this is in 1936. So Chuck, sorry about that women have been participating for a little bit longer. Um, can you press play? This is Insha Afsar, and I think you need to meet her.
I just love her. I think she's really great because she is in herself, her story is using sport, skiing in particular, as a means of recovery, as a means of connection to a new place. And I just, I think that's very powerful, particularly that she's a para-athlete who is now training for the next set of Olympics. Like there's just a lot of strength in her and resilience. And I think that's just so wonderful because sport is a way which through this can actually happen. Um, I created a bingo card because I was being sarcastic many, many years ago and talked about when people report on Muslim women in sports, this is a bingo card that they use. And it was just like, in stories often of Muslim women in sport, you'll have things like the mention, the athlete being hijab clad. Like it always comes in somewhere, like what they're wearing. Um, I mean, if it's a story talking about a hijab ban, I understand that. But if you just have someone competing in a squash competition, talking about their headscarf isn't necessarily relevant, particularly because that sport doesn't have a hijab ban or an exclusion. There's really no need to talk about it in that way. An expression of awe, of delight that Muslim women is familiar with sports or playing sports. Like even the way that it, sometimes it feels like, and this is a joke within my friends, my Muslim women friends, like, if I will write, oh, I went for a really nice walk today. I, you know, I love the winter time. Someone will be like, that's so amazing, Shireen. Keep breaking the chains of patriarchy. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going for a walk. <laughs> so like the kind of pressure that's on you to like constantly be performative in your activity. It's like, I just really was going for a walk. But OK. Um, a big one is family approval, like from father, husband, brother, community. I was interviewed for a magazine and I was talking about playing soccer and someone's like, what did your dad think about that? And I was like, I don't know, I never asked him. Like, I asked him for money when I needed to pay fees, but I just never, it's always the assumption that women are controlled inherently by, there's no doubt that Muslim women come from spaces that when they're supported by their families, they do exponentially better. But I think that's the case for many women and non-binary communities that when you are supported by people around you, you tend to do better. I think that's not restricted to, these are things that we see all along pockets of communities of, Mus of not just Muslim athletes, but women athletes in general. We can talk about soccer in South Latin America. We can talk about, you know, basically volleyball in Europe. When women are supported, they do better full stop. Another, like, negative opinions. Oh, this is also great. I remember reading a story that somebody did, and I actually reached out to the journalist, and I said, you really need to, you need to pull this back. They were talking about Skatistan, which is an absolutely wonderful organization. It's a nonprofit that runs out of Afghanistan. So it's a bunch of volunteers that go there and they use local teachers and they teach the kids how to skateboard. And because skateboarding was not, you know, very common in Afghanistan, it didn't come with pre notions of gender norms. So anybody could skate. Any, it was incredible. So it's a very successful organization that's now moved to South Africa and Cambodia. They've expanded. And they use local people as teachers to keep the kids in school. So it's wonderful. So I remember reading an article that somebody wrote about this. And the opening two paragraphs were on Osama bin Laden. And I was like, what does that have to do with Afghani girls, Afghan girls skateboarding? I really do not understand. And they were like, oh, Osama bin Laden had ties there, so we want to set the tone. I get that you want people to click on your story. Trust me, I understand this. But it, you lose the essence of what you're supposed to talk about. Like, I just, you don't, you don't need to bring him in there. He's nothing to do with skateboarding. Like, to my knowledge, he didn't even, I don't know. I don't know if he skateboarded. Like, I don't know. But like, it's, it's not relevant to the young girls, right? So if you go through this more, there's mention of violence against women in that community, that Muslim women are either repressed or not allowed to do something, as Chuck Culpepper so beautifully illustrated. There's always this talk about the negative. Um, I'm not into, like, I'm not, I'm not doing PR for the Muslim world here. Like, I report on things adequately, but setting the tone negative to say someone's pushing up against it, I think is a little unfair. Um, the mention of country of origin, immigrant or status. Like if there is a runner from the US who's African American, I know I had this young girl speak to me about this. They kept pushing or they misidentified her as being from Somalia. 
And she's like, I'm sixth generation American, African American. I'm not from Somalia. And they had to actually issue a retraction and say, or a correction that, you know, she's actually not from Somalia. And she's like, that was really frustrating for me because she couldn't just be an American kid. She had to be from somewhere. She had to be othered. So my bingo card started off as a joke, but if you take stories and use this as a measure against what you're reading and how it's written, it can be pretty scary. So the result of this is continued objectification. Muslim women as fighters and challenging the norm. We become immediate activists and our lived experience becomes fetishized. And that's, oh, it's so true in so many cases. So how do we fix this? And of course, I'm gonna plug my podcast because I love my co-hosts in this project. So Burn It All Down is our thing. One of the ways and the best ways that you can actually do this is to amplify Muslim women. It's really not that complicated. You can interview them. You can talk to them. There are, there's not a huge, we don't have an association of Muslim women journalists in sports. There is one for Muslim journalists in America. Not of sports journalists, because there's literally five of us, but that's okay. We're growing. Um, two more than there were in 2017. So, but the point is, we talk about nuance. I'm not saying don't ever talk about a report on Muslim women, just don't do it in a terrible way where I will call you out on Twitter, because I will. I will find you. Um, so being part of this team has been very, very gratifying and, and really helpful because I've been able to give the space and to be able to tell the stories in a way that I feel that they're good. And I'm with some like industry experts here. So this is Jessica Luther. This is Dr. Brenda Elsie. This is me, this is Lindsay Gibbs, a sports reporter at Think Progress, and that's Dr. Amir Rose Davis. So we come together and sort of want to basically decimate toxic patriarchy as we share our love of sports. I think it's a good listen, and we're available on Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes, and Google Play. Um, so getting, talking a little bit about sport activism, I didn't, um, I didn't get into this because I wanted to necessarily be that role model or blaze a trail that wasn't my interest at all. It was just, I started writing about sports because I was very sick and tired of the way it was being done. That's actually why I started sports writing. Trust me, it wasn't for the money. So this is Amaya Zephyr, and Amaya Zephyr is a young boxer from Minnesota, and she challenged, and really her story brought a lot of attention on the fact that the AIBA did not allow for hijab in the ring. So fortunately, that has been in the last month, they struck down that ban, which is really great for Muslim women and Sikh men, because very often, Jewish men wearing kippah, Sikh men wearing turbans, and Muslim women who chose to wear hijab were all on the same boat here. It was all about exclusion of them. So this is one I'm gonna, can you press play please, Karen?
that's my dear friend, Bilkis Abdul Kadir. And um, the, this um, trailer was shot a couple years ago. The film is out now fully. It's playing at the Toronto Sport Film Festival in June. It's made some premieres at the New York Doc Film Festival. It played there. And it's a very powerful story because Bilkis is absolutely another example of someone who simply didn't want she didn't want to be an activist a sports she just wanted to be a basketball player that's all she ever was and that choice was taken away from her and i um, joke with her now i had reached out to her for an interview in 2013 it took her forever to get back to me like years like years seriously and i complained to her mother when i met her so she got in trouble for that so we're all good um, I actually attended Bill Keese's wedding and I have a cameo in this film, which is kind of hilarious because I wasn't expecting that either. So her journey of how to deal with it and challenging FIBA was really, really stressful. And I had covered a lot of the FIFA ban and when it was um, lifted in 2014, March 1st, I remember exactly where I was because this... I mean, I wasn't good enough to go pro. I'm not gonna lie to everyone. I played left bench at the University of Toronto. But, but it took away the opportunity from kids that were good enough. I, and it's, it's, it's disheartening for me as someone who can look back. Like I have a child, she's a goalkeeper, and I know that her decision to move forward with soccer as opposed to basketball was directly correlated to the fact that there would have been possibly a risk for her if she went with basketball. She wouldn't have been able to because at that time, the hijab ban was not lifted by FIBA. But it, for soccer, it was. And can you imagine making your decision on what you play based on whether you'll be included in that community? It's sick, it's really stressful. And these are kids we're talking about. We're talking about girls as young as 10 years old. And there's an entire generation of girls who were excluded from sport in this way because a bunch of powerful men in a room decided what they couldn't and couldn't wear. And the idea that a hijab could be harmful to oneself was absolutely debunked through medical staff. It, like the history of it, I wrote about for The Guardian and why that happened. And, but it was simply how many Muslim women did they reach out to to talk about this? Like it was Muslim women that came to the rescue and created prototypes of hijabs that could be used in sport based on the recommendations. So it's like literally women always finding solutions to the problems that are created by men. That's basically my life story. So in addition to FIBA, we have other, we have not just FIBA, we have, I've actually listed them off. We have boxing, AIBA, we had FIFA, we've been through this, volleyball, we have swimming in the UK, FINA has like amended their restrictions on what women can wear when they're swimming in com competition. And not everybody wants to be an athlete, but we're talking about simple things just like inclusion. So you know I'm gonna talk about France here. You know that's gonna happen. As we're talking about, one of the biggest criticisms of Muslim and Muslim identifying communities in France is very much correlated and centered around Muslim women and what they wear. So if we're talking about adaptation and integration into communities, what's the most normal way to do that? It's through sport. So what's women that want to participate in, I don't know, going to the beach on a beautiful afternoon in the Mediterranean coast? Let's put on a burkini so we can respect our own wishes to practice and participate in what so many French people do. They go to the beach and enjoy the beautiful scenery. Well, eh, can't do that because you're not allowed to wear a burkini. So you're taking away the option of not even competing, but participating in normalcy, minding your own business in French society. Very recently, there was a French company named Decathlon who had actually sold sport hijabs in Morocco, and it was absolutely sellout. They, they did amazingly well because women in Morocco were looking for something that was lightweight, wicking fabric, because getting Nike shipped to you know, Morocco isn't always the best option. It's expensive. So Decathlon did this. So they decided to bring it to France. An outcry of self-proclaimed feminists decided that it wasn't worthy. So Decathlon ended up pulling the, this from their sales because of actual death threats against their staff and people in stores. So the so-called self-proclaimed French feminists had decided that hijab was a form of sexualized apartheid. Like, I've had people tell me that me wearing hijab is Stockholm Syndrome. 
I still don't get it. I didn't want to get into it. But the idea that a woman is not capable of choosing. So someone will come back and say, well, what about Iran and Saudi Arabia? I'm like, I'm not advocating for forced covering. I'm just saying that forced uncovering is not a solution to anything. Because forcing women out of clothing and some of the depictions of the women in the coast of France had police officers coming and violently ripping off their clothing, clothing that is violent misogyny. It's, for, it's, it's horrific to see because these women just want to go to the beach and they can't and this is how they're thus treated. So France is another conundrum and it also has to be said that when FIFA did strike down the hijab ban in 2014, the FFF, which is the Fédération Française du Football, is still the only federation in the world that still refuses to allow hijab anywhere near the pitch. We're not just talking about athletes, we're talking about trainers and coaches and officials and even staff of clubs are not allowed to be anywhere near the game in a, in a veil, in a scarf, even though FIFA had already said it was acceptable. So we're keeping that in mind and it's especially poignant considering the Women's World Cup is going to be held in France this year. Currently there's no qualifying team that has a woman in hijab on it anyway and as I understand the FIFA rules would govern over the FFF ones but that's not the point. Like look where you are and are these discussions going to come up? Well I'm going to have them during the World Cup. But I'm saying will they come up at all? Do people even know this? And this is particularly hard for me because after Canada, the team that I've always supported the most has been France. And sometimes I think they don't deserve my love. Um, another thing that I've written about in terms of struggles of Muslim women in sport is in Iran. I've written a lot about Muslim women who are not Iranian women who are not allowed to attend any sport, any public venue, or even any public showing of sport in Iran, which is this came into play in 1979 after the revolution and it was a way to protect women from the vulgarity of the stadiums and the excuses being used are like ridiculous but it's to uphold public morality i'm like i don't know my solution to public morality is maybe men can stop being gross in stadiums like that's a solution to me but you know i'm oversimplifying i guess so there is an um, an organization called Open Stadiums, and her, she goes by Sara for safety reasons. She can't reveal her aunt, like her true identity. And there's the Twitter handle. And even today, there's a derby in Tehran, and women can't go. And it's especially upsetting because Gianni Infantino did go last year to that same derby in Tehran, and he didn't even comment on this until he was back safely into the cradle of FIFA who could protect him. This is a violation of FIFA's own statutes of not discriminating on basis of, of gender and Iran does it. And FIFA, I guess, is okay with it. And Sara told me, because I, I was in contact with her, she actually went to Moscow for the World Cup and she said the first time she ever saw Team Meli, which is what they call Team Iran play, was in Russia. So wrap your head around that one. An Iranian woman wants to watch her team play, she has to go to Russia, like so bizarre on so many levels. Um, one thing that I recently reported on was the Afghanistan women's national football team which is coached by two Americans, Kelly Lindsay and Haley Carter, are former US nationals and professional players. Um, there was allegations of sexualized violence against the president of the AFF, which is the Afghanistan Football Federation. And what this did was it sort of shone a light on what FIFA was doing in terms of reporting this kind of abuse. So if a lot of people might not know this, when you want to report instances of rape or sexualized violence, you, your federation is automatically CC'd on your reporting. So it was not conceivable to anybody in FIFA that it could be the head of the federation actually committing the violence. So the women are silenced. I reported on this for Think Progress and what Karim Karimuddin did, who was now the ousted president, but he's still employed by the federation. Um, he uh, set out a rumor that the women that accused him were lesbians. Because in Afghanistan, to be declared publicly gay is dangerous for your safety. So he used the notions of homophobia and like, you know, misogyny melted them together and said, this is how I'm gonna deal with the situation. So it's 
dangerous on many levels for the women. So Khalida Popal is like former team captain and uh, director of, of programming for the team. So she's living out of Denmark. She's a, got repu asylum status in Denmark. So she's been doing a lot of campaigning. I actually started a change.org petition to hold the AFC, which is the Asian Football Confederation and FIFA responsible for this and to change it and to change the way the means that people report and to do better. They have enough money, they have like $4 billion in reserves. They can do that. So let's talk about happy things now because I know this is pretty heavy. So we'll talk about happy things. I'm not just gonna be negative Nancy. Um, so 2016 was the first under 20 Women's World Cup that was held in Jordan. It was the first tournament that FIFA ever had in the Middle East. And Rond Abulstanji was a goalkeeper, is a goalkeeper for the J J Jordanian team. She's, I think she's 20 now. 21 now, and she was in the under 20 tournament. So this for me was a very, I saw this picture and I think I cried because it was the first time I'd ever seen a woman in hijab in a FIFA sanctioned tournament. So it was a really big deal, especially to all the other little girls around the world who might look like her and now can see themselves somewhere. Because not all of us look like Abby Wambach. In fact, most of us might not globally. This is Tabarak Kadim, and she, in addition to Fadima Adnan, and we're going to talk about uniform accommodation and what tangible things that you know school boards and people can do. They're from Deering High School in Portland, Maine. So shout out to anyone connected to Maine, because there's a lot of progressive understanding of what to do. What they did was they actually ordered hijabs and kits to match the school uniforms. So if you chose to wear that, because there's a significant Muslim population in those places from youth, you could be part of the team. And the idea of uniformity is very important here, that you look similar. So that's a really great step for youth to encourage them to participate in sport. So I love that. Um, Kalsam Abdullah also was somebody that had, um, she's got a PhD in data science and she's a power lifter in her spare time. I don't know how these women do this. Um, she fought the IWF and they wouldn't allow women to complete, compete in unitards with legs covered. So she fought them and she won and she was allowed to compete in a unitard with covered legs. Um, this is my friend Rahaf Khatib. She's the first Muslim woman to grace the cover of a running magazine. She runs voluntarily. <laughs> and she loves it. She's actually part in a new Adidas commercial um, with Leisha Clarendon, who I love, who's one of the greatest voices in women's basketball in the world, in my opinion. So the two of them are in the spot for Adidas, and she's wearing the new Adidas hijab, and I've already DM'd her saying, I want one. So um, that's pretty exciting. And I mean, like, the amplification and the idea of her saying that this is what a Muslim woman runner looks like. This is what a runner looks like. Let's take away the Muslim and the woman. This is what a runner looks like. So they're recreating the idea of what a runner can look like. Um, I just love Louisa Nassib Kanemura. She's a retired friend. She's probably my favorite female footballer of all time. I love her. I think she's technically perfect, and I was very sad when she retired after the Rio Olympics. This photo was very important to me, and it brought back a lot of things, because I don't know if you can see, but right here on her hand, as she's lacing up her boots, she's got traces, not traces, designs of henna on her hands. She's of North African descent. You can see it right here. I wrote a piece um, for the toast a couple years ago, simply inspired by this photograph. I remember being a child in my soccer team, trying to scrub off the remainder of whatever henna I had. And in a lot of communities, henna is a sign of celebration and joy. And there she is, being totally awesome, totally normal, got henna on her hands. Like for someone like me, this was a very powerful photograph, where your identity as a Muslim woman, in my case, South Asian, it didn't mix with the idea of what a soccer player could be. So this photo was really, really great. So, and I just love her and want her in my presentation. Um, this is my friend, Batuli Kamara. She plays for the Yukon Huskies basketball team, Bleed Blue, love them very much. They're gonna win this year, um, knock on wood. So she doesn't wear hijab. She is actually from Ghana. And she took a photo and the team was all for it, just wishing her teammates well on World Hijab Day or some day like that. And all she said was encouraging them. And I know Batuli has talked to me about covering, and she said that the team that she plays for, like UConn, is open to the idea of that. 
So it's not like she, which I think is really progressive when you think about high profile that team, how high profile that team is, that she has the support. And so this makes her decision if she wants something to do, something so spiritual and so personal, she has support from people around her. As opposed to someone like my case, when I started to wear a scarf, it was directly correlated with the end of my career at University of Toronto because there was no policy that I could wear it. There was no policy I couldn't wear it. So the answer was always no. So for her to go through this, I think it's just really great. And she's, she's wonderful. She'll be starting a sport management master's program at UConn as well. Um, so the solutions. How do we diverse? The solutions, in my opinion, are diversify hiring practices, and this is specifically in the media. What can everyone else do? Amplify Muslim women in whatever context. We're there. We've got expertise in STEM and sports and arts and culture and whatever. Find them. Read Muslim women. Reject and refute Orientalist viewpoints, and that's really important. I'm not saying cancel your subscription to the Washington Post. I'm just saying maybe you can email the editor and be like, nah diversify your newsrooms. Um, another thing you can do is there is an organization called Muslim Women in Sport Network. And it's a group of women around the world who do different things. I'm, the, I'm on the board and I'm a journalist. There's an activist, there's a woman named Rimla Akhtar who is an MBE, which is a big thing in England. The queen gave her a medal, I don't know, something. All I know is she had a really cute fascinator on her hijab when she went, that was really important. That's an important detail for everything Rimla does. So she's worked with FAIR, she's worked with the FA, and she works about inclusion of Muslim women in sports. So a couple of us got together, and another woman named Asma Halal, who works in Australia, who lives in Australia, and Nada Ahmed, who's a PhD student in New Zealand. So we kind of got together and said, let's do something. And what we've done is we put together a power list. And last year was our first one, just amplifying women from all over the world, different sports, everything from parkour, to amputee climbing, to whatever. And the idea is not, not to humanize, because I'm not very comfortable with the idea of humanizing Muslim women. Like, I don't like the idea that we need to be humanized. But in terms of broadening the definition of what that athlete can look like, it's pretty cool. So, you know, I'll always end on allyship matters. And a lot of the time, I think people have said to me, well, just ignore this hate, or just ignore that Islamophobe, or just ignore that racist, or that transphobe, just ignore them. That's not how progress happens. Not doing anything has never solved anything. So the idea that other people can do easy steps is, you know, it's pretty great. Um, this is a cartoon from Marjan Strapni's um, beautiful movie and graphic book, um, Persepolis, and I love this cartoon. Um, because I just also like to add into my presentations. So she's saying to them, yes, but when you run, you're behind and makes movements that are, well, you say, obscene. And she's so gracious and simple, her answer to them, which is like, don't look at my ass. So if a Muslim woman do, does something that bothers you, it's not a them problem, it's a you problem, so you need to take care of that. So, um, that's my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Shireen, for that very rich uh, talk. Uh, we have uh, a good deal of time for questions and discussion. Um, if you could, I can run around and give the mic. Uh, so we can capture it uh, with the video that will be on the IACS website. But thank you. Uh, right here. Hi, Shireen. Thank you for your talk. To the point of amplifying and allying with Muslim women, I, I, something in my head clicked. You've seen these youth teams where a young lady has to have her head shaved for some reason, and the rest of the team goes ahead and does it. Have, we seen, have you seen anything like that with hijab? Totally. Um, in terms of wearing hijab in solidarity? Yeah, yeah, so solidarity effort like that. It's not my means of choice, um, personally. I think kids do what kids do to support their teammates, and I can't speak to that. Depends on the location, the situation. I did, the most in-depth piece of reporting that I've ever done was not for an outlet, because no one would take my piece. It was 
2014, and it was a story about a young girl named Sama in Oregon. And she wasn't allowed to play because she wore a sport, a hijab, even though when I called the state authority, there was no such rule. She could have played. The coaches were just too lazy or didn't care to do so. So what her team did is they all wore hijabs, took a photo, had a hashtag called Let Sama Play, and it went viral. Like Upworthy featured it, everyone, because it was a feel-good moment. It did nothing for her because I followed up. They took a photo. What happened after? Did anyone call the state sports authority, the high school thing that sort of the governing body? No, not a single person other than myself had called. And I find that not enough. I don't expect huge amounts from youth. Like they're young, they're learning, it's their journey. But I expect more from adults who should have called, who should have said this is a problem, pressured the coach, talked to the principal of the school, done something, because it's clear injustice. And it did nothing for her. So as far as kids want to do that, do that, support your teammate. I love that, especially in you know in wake of things like what happened with Andrew Jackson, the the black wrestler whose dreads had to be cut. Like that's horrific stuff there. That type of what happened there and what happens we see. So, you know, kids do a lot these days anyway. But I would expect just a little more than just a photo shoot to make yourself feel better. Sure. Other questions, thoughts? Yeah. Okay. Can you speak uh, about that movement that seems to gain traction of like hashtag ex Muslim or hashtag ex Muslim because and how that affects, I guess, the, the efforts to. Um, integrate and, and accept Muslim women in sports? Um, yes, I can speak to that. Um, the thing is, is that I have a lot of atheist friends. I can't believe I'm starting with, I have friends that are atheists. Um, so tacky. Um, but the idea that ex-Muslims are the only ones who declare themselves to be atheist Muslims. Like, I have a friend who's atheist who was Catholic. He doesn't say I'm a Catholic atheist. He just says I'm an atheist. So I have a couple of opinions on this. One, there's an entire industry based on homo, like, sorry, Islamophobic and racial industries. There's entire news outlets that are dedicated to this. I will never discount someone's opinion, particularly if it's women that have experienced forced covering or abuse in the name of faith. You know, there is so much abuse that happens at the hands of men and even women who uphold that type of patriarchy and violent patriarchy. So I'm not going to discount someone's experience. My problem is when people like Ayan Hirsi Ali come and talk about how it is for all Muslim women, because that's not true. Not every Muslim woman all over the world has had the same experience you do. So that's where I draw issue with that. And I know right now, and I forgot to mention this, so thank you for reminding me. In France currently, there was a woman named Annie Sujier, who is a feminist, who was lobbying the International Olympic Committee to ban hijab from all Olympic events, period, because of the games that will happen in France. And that is a huge problem. Because right now, there's only three countries that are Muslim majority that insist that women wear hijab when they play. One is Saudi Arabia, one is Iran, and one is Qatar. The other ones don't. Not even Pakistan, not Bosnia, not Turkey, not Indonesia, not Algeria, not Morocco. I can go on. You get what I'm saying. So the idea that the women that represent those countries have to be forcibly have their scarves removed is not just and it's not acceptable. So Emi Sujia, who I don't know what her background is in understanding Muslim women and the nuances of you know, being a Muslim woman because she's clearly not one, that runs in line. And those two industries feed off each other. Like, look, this woman here has had it, you know, was forced to wear a hijab. Yes, that woman, I hope she gets, you know, healing from that trauma that she experienced because I believe it. I hate the fact that women are forcibly covered because it's against the actual principle of the faith, which is there should be no compulsion in faith and practice. So 
I chose to wear this not because I suffer from Stockholm Syndrome, I'm really sorry, ex-Muslims, because that's the group that accused me of that. It's because I'm making a very conscious choice. I also realize that I live in a place and I have privilege that if I choose to no longer wear hijab, no one's gonna come after me, because I live in Toronto. So it's, it's mixed, but I find them to be extremely, they can be very detrimental to growth movements that are simply about inclusion. So I hope that answers, Faxan. Thank you. Anyone else? Shireen, thank you for coming. Uh, I think there was a connection, and you kind of hinted at that when we were talking just before your presentation in your notion of allyship. Uh, and Dave's discussion of, uh, of, of Norman, from, Stephen Norman from Australia, and it strikes me the self-negation that Norman engaged in, uh, in his allyship, was rather striking uh, and amazing. I, I, I choked up. I had to call my wife afterwards because I was so broken up about that story. But, what kind of allyship can those of us who aren't women, who aren't Muslim, what kinds of things uh, can we do uh, that would help in this? Well, things like a lot of the time hijab bans, FIBA was very directly moved to change their policy because of a change.org petition that reached over 130 signatures. So when you get those emails, don't discount them immediately. <laughs> Because, I mean, my son kept sending me, save the bees, save the bees. He wouldn't get off my back about the bees. So I signed the petition, and a couple months later, suddenly the bees aren't in danger anymore. I don't know. It's just, sorry, I digress about the bees. But my point is, is that don't discount ways that meaningful, impactful change can happen. I, the boxer that I mentioned and I showed you, Amaya Zuffer, she first got into media spotlight because she was at a bout in Florida, and her opponent, she was disqualified. Her opponent was so upset, this young girl, that she was mortified that Amaya was excluded from the bout and the, the whole tournament. She ended up giving her belt and her championship to Amaya and said, I want you. And she was only 15. Like, I wouldn't ask that of somebody at that age because, again, they're young. It's a learning process. But that act is what spiraled change and movement and got attention because that's also a really good story. Because let's not forget the way that media kind of presents is still centered around people with privilege. The story wasn't about what Amaya had to go through. It was. The, the, it was. And as much as Peter Norman is really important, the whole idea that he didn't want to be put into the monument was to make place for other people. And in my experience, that is the test. Do you make place for other people? Do you give other people a chance to speak? Do you amplify other voices? Do you amplify voices that are just simply not yours? And I've seen it, unfortunately, far too little. And in my experience as a woman in the industry, I have been the least supported in the industry by white women. And I'm, like, that's a fact. And a fact that many other women of color, non-binary folks of color will tell you. So there's a lot that can be done here. As simple as you're invited to talk about something. Do you have expertise to talk about it? Like you see something happening at your child's school, like is there a way to be a little bit more, like can you not appropriate other cultures? Like if your children are doing something for Columbus Day, ugh. you can even have a conversation with your school about how problematic that is. Like there's ways to not, because what I am finding in terms of allyship, the crooks and the weight of this is always marginalized communities coming together. When Trump invoked the Muslim ban on travel. The first message I got was from my two queer friends that are married. And they messaged me and they said, Meg and Marjorie said, we are here and we're protesting. And I, I still get teary about it because it was the first people with race privilege to call me from a community that is also marginalized and literally attacked. So. There's things that can be done. Like, I'm not expecting everyone to go on the front lines, although if you do, I will totally support you on this. It's just the idea of thinking beyond yourself and what privilege you have and how you can use that to make change. Because at the end of the day, the people who make those, like, principles, those laws and policies, they don't look like me, they look like you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask to you, uh, about, uh, especially in the sport, how the negotiation a Muslim woman in the inside the industrial of the sport, you know, uh, 
communication and everything. Uh, how to Muslim woman to negotiation the situation? With this specific thing? Uh, industrial sport and also with industrial sport and also with the law of the Syria uh, uh, Muslim Sharia, you know, sure. Sharia, yeah, right? Sure. How to Muslim woman negotiation with uh, between law Muslim and also between industrial sport. Okay, well, I think his question is how do the Muslim women sort of navigate through Sharia law via V in sport and federation laws? Well, not, like I mentioned, not every country, Muslim majority country, has a policy on how women should dress while they're competing in sport. So in many cases, it's up to the woman to decide for herself. And I know this is an absolutely novel theory, but letting women decide what they can wear is possible. I know it's mind blowing for so many. But you know, we're responsible, I don't know, for birthing humans and sustaining life. Maybe we can pick our own wardrobes. And I think the thing about this is that's really important is that even in, within Muslim spaces, men, Muslim men need to, they're the first people I tell to sit down. You're self excluded, obviously. But what I mean is, you don't get to opine because you're Muslim. Your rules about what Muslim women wear are not okay. You don't get a pass because you're Muslim. So the, like, the lived misogyny and sexism that women face is, yes, also from our own communities. So as far as how Muslim women navigate through this, you would have to talk to 500 million of them because we're not all the same answer. I did what was comfortable for me. I can only pray and hope that other women get the opportunity to make those same decisions. I mean, if you want to, my whole catchphrase is a burkini, a bikini, or a burqa. I'll support all choices. There has to be place for all choices. And why people get hung up about it. Like someone's entire identity as a Muslim isn't compromised because of what they wear. The whole idea is that you're who you are because of how you act and how you think. It, it's really not correlated in my mind, to my mind, um, about that. So some federations, like I know in Turkey, they're very open. Egypt is very open. You saw Doha El Khobashi, a woman, that, the volleyball player. She wore a scarf. Her teammate didn't wear a head cover, but she decided to wear a T-shirt and leggings. So everybody chooses what they want. And in my opinion, that's the best way to move forward, is to let women decide. Thank you. We have another question in the back here. So this one's more of a media specific question um, that I'm hoping you can help me answer how I should provide guidance to a student that I have um, who wears uh, hijab and uh, wants to be on air. And I know that's a challenge. Uh, I know a few barriers have been knocked down uh, in the last couple of years, but um, what sort of advice can you give for students who wear hijab who want to be on air what kind of advice could you provide that I could share or that others could share uh, in having those conversations in the classroom? Well, first of all, thank you for that. I love the fact that that's what she's aspiring to because that means that she must see herself represented or be imagining that this is possible. And when possibility is there, the rest will come in terms of dreaming and, and working towards it. Um, like I said, it's no different from Muslim identifying women and a visible Muslim woman than it is for a woman of color. Like the type of misogynoir directed at black on-air journalists is similar. There's layers of sexism and racism that all pile up and with, you know, very often people will say to me, they didn't, I wrote a piece about Sidney Crosby going with the Penguins to the White House. So someone replied and said, go back to where you came from. And I'm like, Nova Scotia? Like, where, where am I going again? Okay, like, you know, or someone, like, so be prepared, and this is something that I know women in the industry will all tell you, be prepared for that horrible abuse. And I hate that that's the first piece of advice I would have to give her, is like, brace yourself. And look to your teammates, look for a group of support, and they will support you. Like, I've had incredible allies in media. Like, I started doing this in parcel because I hated the way it was being done, but also because of people like Dave Siren. Also because of people like Jessica Luther, you know? Like, so it's, it's, you see yourself, there's a place for you somewhere. And to tell her to keep working towards it, yes, I would say challenge people on pay. I mean, ask them for what's fair. 
don't do free labor. I would give all these pieces of advice that do that. And you're good at what you do. Work at your craft is the most important. If I read some of the pieces I wrote in 2012, I'm like, oh my God. But like, tell her to keep working at it. And it's a growth, it's a journey. Like you're not gonna be, you're not gonna peak at like 26. And if any of you have, then you know, you're, that's great. I haven't yet, like I just, I'm still working. Cause you're constantly changing the way journalism is, is constantly changing also. Like I wouldn't, and I like radio very much. I joke and say I have like a face for radio. So I, I really enjoy it. And there's different ways that she can be involved. She's very focused on being behind a camera, kudos to her. But there's so many different ways to do that, to digital storytelling, to radio, to, shorts to you know graphic novels to media is so different now so tell her to just go after what she loves and keep fighting okay thank you um other questions anyone over here questions thoughts okay um we still have a, a couple minutes but um any final thoughts um i'm very positive I don't mean to think I'm not positive. I'm a super positive person. No, I just sort of really appreciate the space. And I know this is a lot of information. I know it was a lot. Like we basically went through the gamut of everything I think I think of. But I do see more, I see progress in places where I necessarily wouldn't. There's tangible changes and differences. And in sport, right away you see a difference. You see inclusion immediately now. The effects of lifting bands on hijab in different sports are not going to be immediate because you have to train those young athletes who are now interested. But it'll come. And I mean, as much as I think the IOC is just like a horrible cartel, like the way I think of FIFA, I get a little weepy at the Parade of Nations. I'm not going to lie about that. I get a little, you know, emotional when I see all those, especially for the para games. I don't know if anyone has watched the Parade of Nations for the para games. They're absolutely incredible. And ironically, the para games is one of the places where there have been the most inclusion of Muslim women in scarves is because they have different accommodations for the sports because of equipment that the athletes might need for support. So like a friend of mine who's in Singapore, I interviewed her for a piece in like 2016 for the Paragames. She's a bocce ball athlete and she's completely paralyzed from neck down and she uses her breath. I don't know if anyone knows what bocce ball is. So she uses her breath and her like eyesight to line up balls. It's incredible. And she's never had to deal with a hijab ban because like in a way, parasports can be more inclusive so we can look to places that we wouldn't think of to lead the way because already doing so so i don't know sports are also a place that make me happy they make me incredibly frustrated and sad sometimes but i think that's with everybody so that's all <laughs> okay thank you shereen